When you receive your new Swifter Scan Winder, it's going to come in a pretty large box. As you can imagine, uh, we've got 31 inch aluminum arms in there, so I think the box is 32 inches long. Oh, and about uh, 10 inches wide and 6 inches thick. Many of the components are, will come packaged in um, bags, paper bags, which contain all the hardware and the various components. So it makes it easy to organize and when you remove the items from the box I recommend you keep them separated and then open uh, the bags as you need them. So you'll have a uh, bag called the handle assembly and that's just what it sounds like. The yarn gut assembly is uh, for the uh, skein winder, it mounts on the table. You'll have four of these bags which are yarn, guide posts, and sled assemblies. Those are the, the sleds that uh, slide back and forth. This is a sled assembly. Normally you'll have a rubber band around it. So you just take that out. It's already completely assembled for you. This is the handle assembly. Comes with some hardware. This is the hardware bag. It contains quite a few items uh, as are listed on the label. So you should make sure when you open that bag that you have all those parts. Of course, if you're missing anything, just contact us and uh, we can send something out to you. But uh, we use special care to make sure everything is in there when it ships out of our facility. So you can see those are all the parts that come with the unit. Doesn't seem like very many parts, does it? But once you open this bag, there's quite a few components in there. So be very careful when you open that hardware bag. Uh, make sure you lay those components out in an area that you can uh, keep track of them easily. You know, on a nice white carpet like this, it's not a problem. I can see wherever I put those parts. Um, I don't recommend opening every bag up until you're ready to use them, quite frankly. So you know, keep these bags organized. Uh, you've got four sled assemblies, one handle, one yarn gun assembly, the hardware bag, the base unit, the I-beam we call it, which is the main column, and the two arms. Although I don't have a label on here, on the bottom of the unit you'll normally see a production date label. Uh, it'll give you a, a version number, revision number, and that can be helpful in the future if there's ever a, a question about a specific uh, revision that uh, we need to update. Although you can put the unit together in different uh, phases, uh, you, can, you can mount the I-beam in the base initially and then build from there or you could start working with the aluminum arms. So in this case I'm going to get the uh, I-beam set up and I'll put the uh, shaft through from the back. The shaft already comes assembled with the collar installed. There's a large washer there. By the way, the, the front of the I-beam has got this T-nut, exposed T-nut you'll see. That should be towards the logo plate, just so I'm clear on that. It's very important because that T-nut, if you put it in backwards, it can actually work itself out over time, so you don't want to do that. We usually mark the word back right on this section of wood. So anyway, that goes together like that. So the back, you always put the shaft in from the back. Goes through the bearing. These bearings may look a little different than the ones uh, you've seen on the website. Initially we had a two uh, bolt bearing and now we've gone to four bolts. It's a much uh, better design. And you'll know that that shaft is in properly if it's flush right here with the the thick portion, and I'll show you that. This portion right here, the shoulder of the of the bolt or the shaft. Sometimes you have to jiggle that plastic piece. This, these are the bearings. The yellow plastic are the bearing surfaces. Those bearings, by the way, uh, actually ooze out lubricant over time. So it's a very uh, high-tech bearing made in Germany. Uh, there's no maintenance required on these bearings. Even if they wore out, let's say you use this uh, unit uh, 24 hours a day for a long, long time, if the plastic actually wore itself out by the shaft rotating in it, you simply take this plastic uh, unit off and you can put a new one on very easily. And uh, they're not very expensive either. 
compared to a ball bearing. So they're actually a superior design over ball bearings and they cost less. So that's how that part goes in. You would then take the large washer, it's a two inch washer, put the smooth part of the washer against the bearing all the way in on the shaft. And then we're going to uh, mount the arms. The arms come as an A and B unit. Um, the B for back, I guess you could say, uh, has got a magnet on the back. Even though you may have purchased a Swift, we mount that magnet on all the arms in case you want to upgrade later. You can see they nest together. They snap right on. What you do at that point is you put it onto the shaft. Push from the back on the shaft to keep it from popping through. And you'll see a little notch in that shaft. Make sure the notch is in line with the uh, arm itself because the four lobe washer has got a little tab in it. And we're going to position that tab to go through that slot. And as we push it in place, the four lobes of the washer fit inside the arms. So now it's all interlocked. The shaft, the arms are all interlocked by means of that four lobe washer and the tab that it has. Then put a 3 8 inch washer on there. And I don't have it here right now, but the next step would be a lock washer that would go on over the shaft. And then we'll put the, the nut. Now you can use a regular wrench. I happen to have a socket wrench here. It's uh, 9 16 So while you're holding an arm, you're going to tighten that down. Oops. Yeah, make sure you hold the arms. And it's going to it'll tighten right down. And now what we've got is a one integrated shaft assembly with the arms installed. Spin it to see how it goes. We'll leave a little bit of play in there. Let me loosen that up a bit. Sometimes you might have to adjust the rear collar. I'll show you how to do that in a second. because that's where the play would come from. So we'll do that in a second here. On the back of the shaft assembly, which would have been pre-mounted, is a collar and a big washer. Now in general, we don't want a lot of play. So in other words, you shouldn't be able to grab these arms and have much play or slop in the system. But on the other hand, we don't want them so tight that they it actually restricts the motion. So you pretty much just push that front assembly back and then you tighten this collar. Tighten it partially at first. It should spin freely like that. If you find that, like when I originally put this together, it was a little bit restricted, so that's why I determined that I needed to loosen this assembly up. There really is no adjustment on the front. The adjustment's all on the back here. So, you notice if I take that and push it in and out, there's just a slight amount of play. Not very much. But it allows you to spin the, spin the wheel, so to speak. So, now that I've shown that that is the right position, because I can actually spin it, my arm wrench in there, which sometimes is a little tricky. And you just torque it down real tight. You don't want that to loosen up at all once you've found the, uh, the correct position for it. And that's how it should spin. In fact, uh, when I normally do a spin test, I find that uh, if I spin that real fast, I should get it to spin up around 20 times on its own. Also, you have a knob. It'll be a little different than this knob. This is not the production knob, but it'll be going through from the back 
into the I-beam, into that T-nut that we showed you earlier. Make sure that's nice and tight. That makes that unit one solid uh, unit can't come loose and it prevents them from, from wobbling, of course. Okay, so now what we're going to do is mount the uh, different components that go on these arms. And the first part I'm going to do is put the little mounting plate for the handle, since that goes in first. It's going to go in on the arm that has two holes on the inner portion. Slides in there. You take the quarter twenty, it's a pretty thick uh, bolt, and I'm going to put it through the inner hole. And as you put it through there, it threads in. It comes back to be through that little plate. You can now still access it from the side while it's close to the I beam. through there, and you put your handle on. So at this point, if you've tightened that screw, you just have to thread this on. Be careful with that clip, you don't want to cut yourself or actually damage the clip as you're tightening this. Just give it a good turn, and you can also turn the screw from the back, but that's going to be pretty much tight at that point. So once that's on there, and don't forget, I put a lock washer and the screw in there. You need the lock washer under that uh, screw head, otherwise this handle assembly will loosen up and cause a problem. And see how that knob rotates very easily on there. So that's the first thing you should do, is get that handle on. Now you can leave the handle off, it's not a problem. Uh, Swift users may not want to put that handle on. That handle causes the unit to settle, as you can see here, in that position. So, in some cases, if you're just using it as a swift, you may find that that can be an issue for you. Now, you can always take this handle off without removing that mounting plate, but you will have a, a screw sticking through, uh, which, you know, you may get things caught on. So, you should, pretty much should decide right at the beginning whether you want to mount the handle or not. We do recommend you mount the handle only because it's a good place to grab onto the unit if you're going to turn it. So give it some thought when you're, before you're putting everything together. Okay, now we have to mount the four sleds. When you take your sled out of the bag, make sure the knob is, is uh, turned out a little bit so that the black brake is flush with the aluminum extrusion. Okay? The knob always goes in first into the extrusion. You want the outer section, the dowel, where the yarn's going to go to be on the out, outside edge. Obviously uh, that would work much better than if you had this knob out there and the yarn would go around the knob. So make sure you do that. Once you get it in place, tighten the knob. And that keeps it from sliding back and forth. You can continue then with all four knobs if you want. Or you can then put on the hardware. The hardware that we're going to put on is a little screw. It's a 1032 uh, machine screw. It threads through from the back. It's got a lock washer on it. Make sure you put that lock washer on. Tighten it all the way through with a Phillips uh, screwdriver. And torque it down. There's a little cap that goes on that part, rubber protective cap. Make sure you put it on there and finish it off with the end cap. That protects you from the edges of the aluminum. Then you move on to the next one. Make sure that brake is in the proper position. The proper position for the black brake, in case it does come out, because they, it's, it's not really contained in there except for a pin, there's a rounded edge on, the, on two of the sides. You want those rounded edges to go towards 
the outside of the sled here so that when they press against this in, inside the extrusion, they don't leave a mark. Slide it in, apply the brake, put the next uh, screw in, the stop screw we call it. Work it down. Put the protective cap on, and then the end cap. Move on to the next one. Make sure the brake is properly positioned, otherwise you will have difficulty getting it on. Like for example, if I try to stick that in there now, I can't get it on because the brake is sticking outside the envelope where it should be. In other words, it's in a, a brake being applied position. And then you just slide that in there. Put the next screw in. You're the last one. See, it goes pretty quick. Okay, so we've got uh, all four uh, yarn guide posts installed. This one seems a little stick, uh, stiff here. I was saying that this one seemed a little stiff, and I noticed this label. So we apply those labels uh, as best we can to two surfaces, um, and we do inspect them before they go. But if for any reason that label extends out into this cavity, it can interfere with the sliding of the sled. So what you do in that situation, if that ever developed, just take a nail file or even a piece of sandpaper, light, fine sandpaper, and rub it along that surface. Try to wear away that excess label that's sticking in that cavity. And then just take the uh, sled and go back and forth. And, and you'll wear away that excess material on there. It should be smooth. It shouldn't be catching. So you may have to repeat that process. You know, now hopefully you won't have any uh, units that, that exhibit that problem. Because we'll certainly catch them here if they do happen. Uh, but in any event, if that does happen to you, that's what you do to, to correct the problem. Now you notice I mentioned before that the handle can tend to cause the unit to settle in a certain position. So if that's annoying to you when you're using it as a swift, uh, you can always um, remove the handle and that would re remove that issue. The problem is though that you're going to lose your clip. That clip, I don't have the right screwdriver here to do it, but if you use a number one Phillips screwdriver, you can insert it through the hole of the clip, loosen the screw, and turn this to go another direction. So it can be facing either direction, but always tighten it down after you make that adjustment. Then leave it in that position. Don't be uh, switching it back and forth. Um, you'll find the, the right position for you, I'm sure, as you use the unit, and then you can make that, that final adjustment. So the next step is you, you've got the unit assembled. Uh, but you don't have it mounted to a table. Remember, this is a table top unit. So you take your bolt clamp assembly, run it through the slot. Now 
this table doesn't have a good lip on it, unfortunately. It's a folding table that I've covered. Uh, but in essence, you're going to position that in as far as you can get it. And then tighten the, uh, the wing nut underneath. You want to tighten it fully. And you want to put two of them on. We give you two, we'd like you to use two the wrong way. Systems that only have one bolt or one clamp, and if they're big, uh, you need two. That's what we've always found in our ball winders, and we're going to continue that practice on all this equipment. Now you do have two slots on the side here. If you wanted to mount it, you would move this unit over to the edge, right on the corner. And you put one in the far back position and one in the far left position. Or vice versa on the other end of the table. Now one other thing we can do here, as I mentioned in one of the other videos, you can rotate this. Why would you do that? Well, let's say I wanted to get to some other area over there or something. Um, you can either do that or, you know, if you want to go straight back. We pretty much can hit any area on the table because of the ability to rotate this whole unit. And you still have two slots on every side. Plus the ability to rotate the plate. This plate here, by the way, I think is an early production plate, so it's only 60 degrees of motion. The final production unit had 90 degrees, so another, there's another angle that this will turn to in the final production units. Normally, though, you'd have the knobs at the front and the back, and you'd have the two clamps installed. That way, if something happens when you're winding and the yarn or something is going to pull the whole unit all over, it can't, it can't get pulled over. <clears throat> when those clamps install, the unit is extremely safe. And remember now, you're dealing with extremely large arms here, and they're aluminum. You know, they're not going to give way if they hit something. You know, the other item is going to give way. So you have to be especially careful with small children in the area. You know, small children oftentimes want to poke their fingers into things. Uh, this can be extremely dangerous if you have people misusing it, number one, or using it as a toy. Uh, so you have to be very careful not to allow people to, uh, to play with this unit. Finally, on the motorized unit, uh, this is a power base that we're using from our ball winder product line to control the motor at this point, but we will eventually have a, uh, a small remote control device that will sit here on the table outside the range of the spinning arms so you don't get hit. And uh, that will control the motor speed, um, forward and reverse, and on and off function. But I think you can see that when we combine the, uh, the heavy duty design we have, with a powerful high torque motor running about 128 RPMs. We've controlled the speed so it doesn't take off like an airplane, but it certainly will pull any yarn that you've got uh, that you need to pull. It's got the integrated counter and will eventually have a high tech, high performance rotation counter that will also control the motor. So that uh, unit uh, expected later this fall. Will, uh, will be a great new product, we think, combined with the normal Swift that we offer, or Skane Uh And we plan to have many additions and add-ons to these products, including the ability to have multiple skeins run simultaneously. So I think you can see that this is yet another uh, fine addition to our product line here at Nancy's Index. If you have any questions, uh, please give us a call or just check our website. Thank you very much.